Cologne in Germany, 27th of October 2011. Journalists from around the world are gathered at the city's courthouse. Today, Judge Wilhelm Kremer is to deliver his verdict on an extraordinary case of art forgery. From the start, this trial has had a lot of media coverage. There's been a lot of speculation. This is the trial of Wolfgang Beltraki, who forged dozens of paintings and sold them around the world. He passed these paintings off as works by major artists such as Fernand Leger or Max Ernst. Every time uh, Wolfgang Beltraki needed some money, then he painted a new fake uh, to get uh, the money. And then he would live for a few months uh, very good, very nice. Major fraud, which made him massive sums of money, at least 35 million euros, and all for paintings which were declared fake by the courts. For 30 years, the forger, along with a few accomplices, managed to fool the experts, the auction houses, the art dealers, and major collectors. He worked with his wife, Helene. They were the Bonnie and Clyde of the art world, intoxicated by the excitement. In order to hoodwink the art world, which took itself so seriously, the couple came up with an incredibly far-fetched scenario. If somebody would do this in a film, everybody would say, oh, come on, this is not uh, plausible, but in reality it is. From Paris to Cologne, via Berlin, London and Geneva, we went to meet all those who came into contact with Wolfgang Beltraki and his forged paintings. They all talked about an egocentric man who was very sure of himself and a real expert on the art market. He was so sure of himself that he probably thought he was as good as the painters he was imitating. The aim behind it all was financial gain. Today, Wolfgang Beltraki gives the impression of being a real expert on painting. He is guarded and very selective about any media appearances. Wolfgang Beltraki wants to control his, the, his legion and uh, his uh, biography. He doesn't want uh, other people uh, to, uh, to write about him too openly. Too. He, was, he wants to hide some of his stories. This is the true story of Wolfgang Beltraki, the Prince of Forgers. Wolfgang Beltraki was born Wolfgang Fischer in a Germany that was being completely rebuilt after the war on 4th of February 1951, here in Geilenkirchen, a small town in the north of the country. Wolfgang's mother was a private tutor. His father, Willem Fischer, had an unusual job which made a lasting impression on the young Wolfgang. He restored paintings in the region's churches. Well, Wolfgang Beltraki said that um, already from childhood on he started to draw and to paint uh, because he was surrounded by people who were working with paint. He said, um, with the exception of his oldest brother, everybody was painting in the family. So he said it was like uh, brushing your teeth. Um, so every day he was drawing and painting. After the war, life in Germany was hard. To make a bit of extra cash, Willem Fischer had a second job. In the evenings in his studio, he copied works by the great masters, which he then sold at the market. Paintings by Rembrandt, Cezanne and Picasso. The young Wolfgang spent long hours in this studio, silently watching his father. One day in 1965, Willem Fischer issued his son with a challenge. He gave him a postcard of a work by Pablo Picasso. Wolfgang was 14. 
he started painting his first copy. Wolfgang Petracchi said he copied it in such a good way that he surprised his father because he even didn't just copy it, but he made it even better. He perfected it in certain details. And he said his father was really completely overwhelmed when he saw it and almost angry. So he said, but that's probably just a legend, that his father stopped uh, copying and painting for almost two years because he was so upset that his son had surpassed him. I don't know whether the father ever imagined that his son would become one of the most successful art forgers in the history of art. In the 1960s, Wolfgang Fischer was a teenager growing up in a radically changing Germany. To a soundtrack of pop and psychedelic rock, the culture and morals were becoming less strict. In 1968, at the age of 17, Wolfgang, just like all young people in Germany, was fascinated by this evolving counterculture. Late 60s, uh, early 70s, there were uh, the, the rebellion, uh, the hippie movement, and so on. And uh, Wolfgang Fischer was uh, quickly a part of this movement. He was, he was a hippie. After a few years at art school, Wolfgang Fischer got bored and dreamt of travel and freedom. And despite an obvious talent for painting, he dropped out of college without any qualifications. He grew his hair long, and his girlfriend at the time gave him a Harley Davidson. The same as the one Peter Fonda rode in Easy Rider, an iconic film for the hippie generation. For Wolfgang Fischer, that marked the start of a decade of drug-fueled wandering across Europe. Marginal to the last, he took one drug after another. He was smoking pot, and he was uh, uh, he he also smoked some opium uh, at one time, and he he did a lot of LSD. During the 1970s, Wolfgang Fischer lived for a while in Berlin and Paris, and then London, Amsterdam, and Mallorca. He never really worked, but he had to make a bit of money for his trips. That was when he started painting copies of great masters, just like his father had done. He sold these copies for a few hundred marks at flea markets. He was doing pavement paintings in order to gain money, and he boasts even that he earned more than his father. He said he, uh, he gained 100 D-mark a day, while his father earned in a month 900 D-mark, so you can tell that he was very proud in surpassing his father. Wolfgang Fischer was now 27, and he sometimes went to work on his own creations rather than copying other artists. In 1978, three of his paintings were exhibited in a museum in Munich in Germany. These were surrealist paintings worked in a photorealistic style, uh, acrylic on a canvas. Um, and yeah, they must have been in a certain way modestly even successful because he was exhibited in the Haus der Kunst in 1978. The young painter managed to sell one of his canvases for 15,000 marks, which equates to about 8,000 euros. One gallery even offered him a contract. At that stage, Wolfgang Fischer's life could have taken a different turn, but he refused to sign. He wasn't interested in being an artist. He was lazy and preferred the simple life and traveling to the hard and precarious work of a professional painter. If you are an artist who has to do his art, you know, you usually don't earn a lot of money in the first uh, decades of your career. Um, so you ha really have to, you, you work on your, on your artwork and you live for it and you don't have any money, you, you somehow have to survive. He was not interested in working hard, he wanted to gain quick money, he wanted to have a nice lifestyle, and so he realized it would be much easier to fake paintings than to create own paintings. Wolfgang Fischer was now 30. 
he settled in Dusseldorf at the start of the 1980s. This was where he truly became a forger. Tired of living on very little, he wanted to earn more money. He started copying paintings that were better known in the art world with a view to selling them in specialist auction houses. These works were carefully selected for their style. Wolfgang Betracki was quite clever when it came to the uh, choice of artists he faked because he knew it would have been very difficult to take the really famous artists like, I don't know, Van Gogh or Renoir or something like that. So he was quite clever because he chose, if you like, uh, the B-grade artists, which were important, but which are not as famous as the big ones. Thomas Seydoux worked at Christie's, one of the world's biggest auction houses. He was in charge of modern and impressionist art collections, and without realizing it, years later, he handled some paintings Wolfgang Beltracchi had forged. What he did was follow which movement sold well from a commercial point of view, and it's true that surrealism, German and Austrian art, and fauvism were three movements which were big sellers when he was working and forging paintings. But it was another idea, a stroke of genius, which allowed Wolfgang Fischer to really begin his career as a forger. Because he knew straight copies of paintings were very risky. So he developed a hitherto unknown technique. He started painting originals, painted in the style of. For that, he used what were known as catalogues raisonnés, which were a sort of comprehensive inventory of an artist's works. And in these catalogues of works by artists, there would be certain paintings which had disappeared and never been photographed. All you had was their title, size, and a simple description. He used a technique which was quite unusual and very clever. He recreated paintings which had been lost, but which were known to have existed at some stage. They were usually illustrated in the catalogues raisonné with blank squares. He was going through the catalogues of these exhibitions, reading, seeing where are lacks, where are people, where are missing links in the documentation, and that's exactly where he positioned his, fa his fakes then. And he reinterpreted them using the same size of canvas and the same title for his paintings, which showed a vast knowledge of the work of each artist he copied because he did it remarkably well. In order to paint in the style of, Wolfgang pushed his technique to the limit to the point of getting under the skin of the artists he was imitating. He said um, he wasn't just looking at the paintings of the artists he would forge, but he would really try to get everything on their lives at a certain period, uh, up to listening to the music they were listening, um, up to finding out with whom were they talking, what was their habit in everyday life, and then really getting into the mind of uh, the painter. René Allange is a police commissioner in the crime squad in Berlin. He was in charge of Wolfgang Fischer's arrest. He really immersed himself in the work of the artist he was copying. He read a lot about them. He went to various places to soak up the atmosphere and to see the landscapes for himself. No other forger had ever shown such inventiveness and imagination in their long-term plan to dupe the market. But once these forgeries had been painted by Wolfgang Fischer, he needed to find a way of selling them on the art market. In the spring of 1985, a chance encounter was to allow the forger to dupe the auction houses. Here, in this cafe in the town of Krefeld, he met the man who was to become one of the key characters in his ruse. Otto Schulter Kellinghaus. Anyone who met Otto Schulter described him as being, or at least appearing to be, more serious and more rigorous than Wolfgang Beltracchi. Otto Schulter Kellinghaus was somebody who always wore a hat and a, and a long black uh, coat, and he was a chic, uh, a gentleman. 
Wolfgang was seduced by the charisma of his new friend and ended up telling him about his activity as a forger. A pact was made. Wolfgang would paint the pictures and Otto would take care of selling them on the art market. Der hatte sicherlich so von seiner Veranlagung, von seinem Auftreten her. The fact that he had a presence and was cultured meant that he was taken seriously by the dealers. Richtig zu sprechen, also he didn't have to convince them of his expertise. He certainly had a lot of contacts. He was in no way a stranger to the art world. With this alliance, Wolfgang went from being a petty criminal to a major criminal. The collaboration between the two men soon bore fruit. Otto Schulter's gift of the gab worked a treat in the art world. And with this setup, the two managed to dupe numerous professionals. Some of the duo's best sellers were forgeries of paintings by German expressionist Johannes Molzan, an artist who had fled Nazi Germany in 1938, leaving behind him numerous paintings which have today disappeared and are not known about. Imitating Moldsan's style, Wolfgang Fischer would paint forgeries in his studio, and then Otto would come up with a story to explain their reappearance. The duo shifted a dozen paintings, and the sale prices far exceeded those Fischer had charged at the flea markets. One of the fake Moldsans made them almost 41,000 euros. The auction houses didn't suspect a thing. The style had been perfectly imitated. From the breadth of the brush strokes down to the quantity of paint used, the forger showed real precision. He had been careful to find out what sort of checks were carried out during the sales of valuable paintings. In laboratories such as this one in London, canvases are analysed in great detail. Nicholas Easter is the scientist who years later uncovered Wolfgang Fischer's forgeries. We're looking for materials that might be appropriate for that particular time or not. So things that are anachronistic, say. So we're taking samples, analyzing in detail to identify, say, certain pigments that were only introduced after the supposed date of the painting. X-rays, carbon dating, tests on the wood, the canvas and the pigments. Everything is scrutinized down to the last detail. To make sure he slipped through the net, Wolfgang Fischer chose his pigments carefully and got hold of very old canvases. He would buy um, old paintings at flea markets. He would uh, take off the paint from the canvas and then he would paint it with a new a painting. Donc il avait le matériel that way, his materials were guaranteed to be from the right era. That meant he could more accurately produce a painting that looked original. And he was incredibly bold when it came to testing how convincing his fakes were. He even sent some of his forgeries to labs such as this one to make sure he passed the scientific tests. He's also uh, said that he produced uh, test paintings that he would pass by a couple of laboratories. Anything that was that came up as being wrong, he would eliminate from his palette. By the end of the 1980s, this was all Wolfgang Fischer did. He painted canvases in waves according to his financial needs, sometimes several a year, sometimes ten a month. These paintings weren't yet fetching record sums, but another encounter was to change everything. In 1992, Wolfgang Fischer was living on the outskirts of Cologne. He met a young woman aged 34, Helene Baltraki. She was blonde with blue eyes, charming and passionate about art.
Helene was struck by Wolfgang's charisma and soon fell under his charm. Beatrice Bray was later a neighbor and close friend of the Baltrakis. She is very familiar with the couple's story. I think it might have been love at first sight. I can't be sure of that. But the way he told the story, it sounded as if it was love at first sight. Yes. In 1993, they got married. Wolfgang Fischer took his wife's surname and became Wolfgang Beltraki. It was the start of an explosive partnership. They met and fall in love and uh, they became a, a, a love couple that was also uh, like Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, they, yeah, a criminal couple. All. From the start, Helene uncovered her husband's secret. On the walls of his house, she noticed several paintings dating from the start of the 20th century. From early on, he told her he, and uh, that uh, attracted her too. She was attracted by this um, criminal guy who has the secret. The young bride made a decision to assist her husband in this major art fraud. Between them, they came up with an unthinkable scenario, an inspired idea which was to enable them to sell paintings for millions of euros, a ploy in which they showed no hesitation in exploiting the darkest part of their country's history. In the 1930s in Germany, under the Nazi regime, numerous works of art disappeared. In 1937, uh, Hitler was always against uh, modern German art, and uh, so he gave the order to confiscate all modern art in all the German museums. The Beltrakis were interested in one collection in particular, that of Alfred Flechtheim, an art dealer who had suddenly fled the country in 1933, leaving behind him a whole part of his collection, Ralph Jentsch is the only expert in the world to have studied the life of this collector. Alfred Flechtheim was not one of the most important art dealers and, and gallerists in Germany. He was Jewish, and the Germans didn't like Jews. Flechtheim had uh, very uh, great difficulties with the right-wing movement. Numerous paintings by great masters were confiscated from Flechtheim's collection by the Nazis after he fled paintings which no one had seen for over 60 years. Wolfgang and Helene wanted to make these paintings reappear on the market because they knew that for this type of work, the sale prices were colossal. But in order to do that, they first had to invent a plausible scenario. So they came up with the simple idea of using Helene's grandfather, Werner Jaegers. As a teenager, he had lived next door to the art dealer, Alfred Flechtheim. The two men never met, but the Baltrakis imagined a fictional scenario where the collector had sold Helene's grandfather numerous paintings for a song. And Jaegers supposedly hid them, because obviously these were considered during the war and under the Nazi regime to be degenerate works. Then, by force of circumstance, they were discovered later, much later, by his descendants, his grandchildren, who finally decided to sell them one by one. That was the gist of the story. It was the perfect scenario, but in order to make it credible, there was one detail missing, proof of authenticity. From a photo of Alfred Flechtheim, Wolfgang Beltraki made this label, which he stuck on the back of the forged paintings. He put some tea on it, he put some, 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 and, and, and he artificially aged uh, the, the label. It's hard to believe it, but this simple label was enough to convince the experts. And whenever any expert appeared suspicious, the couple, showing incredible daring, had no hesitation in fabricating increasingly far-fetched pieces of evidence. In 1995, when the couple were looking to sell this forged painting, Girl with a Swan, by Heinrich Kampendonk, an auction house asked them for proof of the veracity of their story. 
Alain Baltraki came up with this old yellowed photograph with jagged edges. It showed a woman whom she claimed was her grandmother, Josephine Jaegers, sitting in front of the paintings in the supposedly rediscovered collection. In reality, the snapshot was completely fake. The Beltrakis had constructed the image to look like an old photograph, with the grandmother sitting down and in the background the supposedly original paintings. But in reality, the woman sitting on that chair was Helene, dressed in period costume. And astonishing as it sounds, everybody believed these photos to be authentic. The fake period photograph was so well done that even members of Helene's family didn't recognize her. If somebody would do this in a film, everybody would say, oh, come on, this is not uh, plausible. But in reality, it is. It's in a way very funny, in a way very sick. In October 1995, Christie's put Girl with Swan up for auction. It was bought for $100,000 without anyone questioning its authenticity. We were completely taken in, yes. We were getting used to the name Werner Jaegers, and it even became a sought-after provenance because we knew it was quite a rare provenance, and these paintings had an incredible history and must have remained hidden for a very long time. It's crazy, but it shows how much you can believe in things uh, if you want to. And I think that's exactly the point. Uh, nobody would have thought that somebody would be so crazy to do such a thing, such a stunt, where everybody would say, immediately, this will be detected. Nobody will believe in a woman, a woman posing as her own grandmother, but it worked. The Beltrakis grew more and more confident. They were no longer afraid to tackle the big names in painting. With the time, uh, Wolfgang Beltrakis' ego grew so much that he also um, faked now uh, like the big names of art history. Max Ernst, Fernand Leger, uh, Max Pechstein. Um, the, the big, now he was uh, trying to get the millions, not the few thousand euros. By 1995, all the prestigious auction houses like Sotheby's, Christie's, Druo, and Lempertz in Germany were, without realizing it, selling numerous forgeries, supposedly from the Flecktheim collection. The reappearance of certain paintings even provoked a certain euphoria on the market. This was a real treasure trove. Everyone wanted to play a part in its discovery. It's always exciting when things that haven't been seen between 1914 and 2006 suddenly reappear. You think, this must be a masterpiece resurfacing, and you get caught up in the emotion of it all. You're a bit naive. It's an error humane. It was human error based on a fundamental desire to believe in the story because the story was wonderful. And thinking you've hit the jackpot or found the Holy Grail or uncovered an old collection is every dealer's dream. That's where Wolfgang Beltraki was so clever. He knew which buttons to press to win over everyone in the art market and to lend his works a certain credibility. Some of the art historians who were hired to evaluate these forgeries are today being blamed for their lack of vigilance. An expert is an important figure because um, they were in the very end often decisive uh, if a painting was accepted or not. One of those experts was Werner Spies, a major specialist on Max Ernst and the former director of the Musée National d'Art Moderne à Paris. Werner Spies, est le... Werner Spies was considered to be the world expert on Max Ernst. He wrote the catalogue Raisonné. He was a leading light in the art world. In total, Werner Spies authenticated seven works by Max Ernst, which were in reality forgeries by Wolfgang Beltraki. He added them to the catalogue raisonné and issued certificates of authenticity. 
the art historian earned a total of 400,000 euros for his expertise. He was paid a fee for his services. Belchaki paid him a commission on the first sale of each painting, and that caused problems. There should not be one expert who can tell uh, uh, wrong or right by only looking at a painting. There should be committees of, uh, of experts who are debating uh, the authenticity of a painting. Despite the precautions they took, in 1998, Wolfgang and Helene Baltraki came very close to being found out. A collector had doubts about the authenticity of a painting, and the German police set up an inquiry. Wolfgang Baltraki left Germany when he heard that the police was looking for him and so on. The Beltrakis quickly sold their house and set off in their camper van. According to René Allange, the German police officer in charge of the investigation, there was no doubt about it. Wolfgang wanted to flee the country. Er hat sich dann, als uh, wir ihn befragen wollten, when we wanted to question him, he must have fled to France. His version is quite different, but I am convinced that he felt we were on his trail. But we couldn't find him in France. The witnesses, who saw him last, said he was going on a round-the-world trip. He travelled around and he finally found this beautiful spot in, in southern France, in Metz, where a lot of artists have uh, worked, um, a lot of artists he uh, admired or faked. It was here in Metz, a small town in Ero, that Wolfgang, Helene and their two children finally settled. The German police eventually forgot about them and closed the investigation. In 1999, the Beltrakis bought this old mansion and did it up. Locals started wondering about their fortune. How did the Beltrakis earn so much money? He talked about a big house he had done up and sold for a very good price. People just thought they had money, that they were people of independent means. Under lock and key in his studio in Domaine de Rivette, Wolfgang Beltraki continued painting in secret. In 2000, the art market was experiencing a boom. In Cologne, Berlin, Geneva, Paris and London, Beltraki's forgeries were selling like hotcakes. Every time uh, Wolfgang Beltraki needed some money, then he painted a new fake uh, to get uh, the money and then he would live for a few months uh, very good. This is a fake André Durand depicting the port of Collioure. A gallery bought it for 370,000 euros in 2000. This one is more abstract and attributed to the German painter Max Ernst. It sold along with another fake for over a million euros in 2002. This very beautiful painting, portrait of a woman in a hat, is a perfect imitation of the style of Dutch painter Kies van Dongen. It sold in 2007 for 1.5 million euros. In the auction houses, business was booming. Wolfgang Beltraki spent the first decade of the century quietly painting his forgeries in the south of France. Thanks to the collaboration of Otto Schulte-Kellinghaus, who still handled their distribution, the paintings were changing hands all over the world. Buyers included rich businessmen and investment funds. But a few celebrities were also duped by the forger. Very famous persons who bought paintings uh, that were forged by Wolfgang Beltraki. There's, for instance, 
the actor Steve Martin, who bought a fake Compton Donk and who resold it uh, <laughs> very fast. Uh, then there was, for instance, uh, Daniel Filipaki, the French um, publisher. J'ai téléphoné à Daniel Filipaki à l'époque de, de mon enquête en 2013. I phoned Daniel Filipaki at the time of my investigation in 2013 to ask him how he felt about it all. And his immediate reaction was surprising and very sporting. He said, that guy is a genius. His painting is very beautiful, very accomplished. I hung it in my New York apartment, but in the end, I decided to take it down. The painting sold and then resold. After a while, no one knew where they'd come from. That was one of the keys to the Beltraki's success. The couple understood how opaque the art market is. Transactions are kept under wraps for fear of the taxman. The art market is, for some people, like a washing machine for dirty money, a laundering uh, machine. And so um, the people don't ask many questions. They don't make uh, uh, contracts. You just do the business by handshake. It was a muddle which benefited everyone, especially when it came to tax evasion. The forger's business had become very lucrative. With the sale of one or two paintings a year, Wolfgang Beltraki was now living in luxury. In 2005, he bought a second home, 450 square meters in Freiburg. They uh, bought a house in uh, Freiburg, uh, a nice, beautiful uh, house uh, on, on a hill overlooking Freiburg and uh, uh, one of the most, um, most expensive neighborhoods of Freiburg and they let it rebuild this house for hundreds of thousands of euros. They built a wonderful swimming pool. Wolfgang Beltraki now had a lifestyle that was very far removed from his original hippie ideals. I don't think hippies drink fine wine and champagne. It wasn't part of their culture. They had a very nice life. They may have looked like hippies, but these were upmarket hippies. The couple even resorted to cosmetic surgery and treated themselves to facelifts. Wolfgang Beltraki not only faked paintings, but he also faked his own face. He had a facelifting done, and he even spoke about it to a German magazine back then and uh, saying it is so nice to have a new, young face. <laughs> During these years of opulence, the Beltrakis lived the high life, taking holidays in the world's most beautiful palaces. They spent lavishly. He would travel a lot. He would travel to the nicest hotels in the world. Um, I saw the uh, credit card uh, account of uh, him and um, he would uh, stay at the nicest hotels and buy at the nicest boutiques and have a really posh life. Perhaps all this luxury went to his head, but despite his perfectly honed techniques as a forger, Wolfgang Beltraki was to commit a fatal error. He couldn't stop, the greed was too big and he thought he's uh, invulnerable. On the 29th of November, 2006, in Lempert's auction house in Cologne, a forged painting signed Heinrich Kampendonk was sold. Its title, Red Painting with Horses. The painting went for 2.8 million euros, a record sum for a Kampendonk. In reality, it was a forgery painted by Wolfgang Beltraki. Sofia Komarova is the director of a gallery in Geneva. It was she who triggered the downfall of the greatest forger in history. It started with a phone call from one of the gallery's clients, who informed me that he had just bought a masterpiece by Kampendonk that he had done it of his own accord, and I would be proud of his choice. 
Sofia Komarova was asked by her client to oversee the transaction. Since the price of the painting was so high, she was very vigilant about its provenance. I immediately fetched the catalogue raisonné from the gallery's library, and I saw that usually very detailed information is given, whereas this painting was just listed as being some landscape with red horses, painted in 1914 with no dimensions, photos or anything. Her suspicions aroused, she noticed the label on the back of the painting. She wanted to know more about this mysterious collection. So she phoned Ralph Jensch, the only expert in the world on Alfred Flechtheim. He too was suspicious of this portrait affixed to the frame of the painting. It was awful. I mean, I, I mean, Flechtheim never would have uh, allowed to, to, to be reproduced so stupidly. I mean, he looks like an idiot. He looks like an... I mean, it's, ter it's, it's, it's a terrible portrait. The inspired idea which had allowed the Beltrakis to pull off this incredible stunt was now turning against them. This label was arousing everyone's suspicions. Sofia Komarova had the painting delivered to London to Nicholas Eastor's laboratory. When he first examined this painting, he had no idea of the scale of the network he was helping to dismantle. It was almost another routine job, if you like. Uh, so, um, it came in with certain questions that I was trying to answer. Uh, it didn't signal uh, something particularly unusual as far as we're concerned. First, he analysed the label. The results came in thick and fast. The glue used was too recent. It didn't correspond to the date of the painting. And the presence of traces of coffee on the paper were very suspect. They seemed to indicate that an attempt had been made to artificially age the label. Then Nicholas Easter took his first samples of paint, and soon there was no doubt about it. This painting was a fake. In this instance, uh, one of the pigments that we identified was something called titanium dioxide white. And this is a, a pigment that was um, essentially an introduction of the 20th century and we don't typically find on paintings before the mid-20th century. News of a series of fake paintings spread like wildfire. After the discovery of this fake Kampendonk, all paintings from the now nefarious Flechtheim collection came under scrutiny. Once you had detected one forgery, suddenly like a sort of a golden, or if you like, red thread, suddenly all these forgeries were lined up on, like a pearl on the strings and suddenly all these paintings became doubtful. Within a fortnight, the expert Ralph Jensch had identified and located about 15 fake paintings bearing the Fleck Time label. In a couple of weeks, I had all the informations of the Max Ernst, of uh, other Kampendongs, and I saw the same framing, I saw the same labels, and for me it was very clear at the time, they are all fakes. The police started an investigation and there were a lot of people now trying to find out who is the forger of these paintings. Als wir das der Staatsanwaltschaft präsentiert hatten, hatten wir schon When we presented our case to the prosecution department, it already included five forgeries and several million euros worth of fraud. This was not the sort of case to come up every day, so we soon realized that it would take on massive proportions. Sache. The art market was stunned to discover the scale of the scandal. Panic spread through all the major auction houses. There was chaos on the art market. Everyone quickly tried to identify whether there were any other candidates and which other paintings had a similar provenance to see whether they had passed through our hands or not. Everybody was already thinking, oh my God, if this is true, what would that mean? Because it was like a domino play, uh, one stone would tackle the other and you would have uh, a display of a scandal of a huge, huge dimension. The fraud became obvious. People realized that Beltraki's paintings had a certain style in common. I remember seeing the paintings at the laboratory. We were comparing a Kampendonk and a Derain. 
It was interesting to see them side by side and to compare them for similarities. These weren't great quality paintings, but the packaging, the way the nails were rusted and the labels aged, the canvas, it was remarkably well done. The police gathered together several witnesses. Gradually, they identified the gang of forgers. On the 25th of August, 2010, they searched first Otto Schulte Kellinghaus's house and then the Baltraki's house in Freiburg. The couple were eventually arrested that same evening in their car. The authorities didn't know who they were dealing with. They obviously weren't expecting to be dealing with a chic couple in their 60s. So it was a strong arm arrest with sirens wailing American style. We didn't know who we were dealing with. Our suspects left their property in a large four-wheel drive car. There were four people inside and it was raining heavily that day. My colleagues had arrest warrants. The suspects should have handed themselves in, but that clearly wasn't going to happen. So we had to go and bring them in for questioning. Whilst they were awaiting their verdict, the Beltrakis were detained in Cologne. To prepare for the trial, René Allange and his teams assembled all the evidence, the paintings, old tubes of paint, stretchers and rolled up canvases, books on the artists and catalogue raisonné. On the 1st of September 2011, the Beltrakis trial began at the Court of Justice in Cologne. From the start, the trial got a lot of media coverage. There was a lot of speculation. The general public generally feels some sort of sympathy for this type of character. There is skill involved, even if it's a skill of a forger. He had figured out how to profit from the naivety and greed or whatever, of people who have a lot of money. Like Bonnie and Clyde, the two defendants played up to the cameras. Journalists were almost won over by this couple of long-haired hipsters, these Robin Hood-like characters who stole from the rich. The first day, oh, they seemed very, very happy. They, they, were, they were enjoying uh, the bath in, in public. Uh, they suddenly were famous. The trial, which began in 2011, promised to be long, complex and wide-reaching. The case file was massive, 8,000-odd pages long. About 200 witnesses were expected to be called. But it was soon a huge anticlimax. The trial lasted only 10 days. They just had a handful of uh, testimonies being invited, and the case was closed quite quickly uh, because there was a so-called deal between the Beltraki lawyers and the court. The first day of the trial that he admitted, yes, uh, I painted those 14 paintings. The judge was satisfied with that confession, and the verdict was given. Wolfgang and Helene must reimburse the colossal sum of 35 million euros to their victims. They were sentenced to six and four years, respectively, in prison. As for Otto, he got five years behind bars. As is often the case in Germany, the culprits were only partially incarcerated. They had to uh, uh, stay at the prison at night, but they... Um, uh, and on daytime, they could um, stay at their home and uh, work. Some professionals in the art world seemed quite satisfied with the outcome of the trial. The sooner the case was closed, the sooner it would be forgotten. No one really wants to reveal what goes on behind the scenes in the art market. There were dozens of people in the art world very happy that this trial wasn't going on. The art market has never felt very comfortable dealing with fakes and forgers. There has never been an open discussion on the subject. I think people are afraid of being ridiculed, 
or being identified as someone who was taken in by the Beltrakis. Wolfgang and Elaine Beltraki were released from prison in January 2015. They now live in this house in a residential neighborhood of Cologne. The court seized one million euros from their Swiss bank account. The house in Freiburg has been sold and a domain de Rivette has been mortgaged. And yet, according to Tobias Tim, who followed the case very closely, the resolution of the Beltraki scandal is not very clear. Wolfgang Beltraki earned millions of euros with his uh, uh, forgeries. Where all the money has gone is unclear until today. To date, over 60 paintings have been uncovered and identified as being forgeries by Wolfgang Beltraki. Forgeries for which the forger has still never been tried. And he claims to have painted between 200 and 300 fakes over the course of his career. Since his release from prison, he has stopped forging paintings and has decided to capitalize on his incredible story. Now famous, he has made numerous TV appearances and is fast becoming a legend. Well, the Beltrakis are now um, selling their story, if you like. So they're touring through the talk shows in, in Germany. There are uh, parts of movies and films, documentaries about them. Finally be exposed in a way because he now could tell the whole world what a, what a genius uh, forger he is. But when it comes to going a bit further and telling the true story, Wolfgang Beltraki had refused to respond to any communication. We rang the doorbell of his home and studio in Cologne, but no one answered. We approached him on several occasions for an interview, but the couple, their lawyers, and even his publisher refused to grant us one. You are not allowed to use or to show any unauthorized material of our clients. Here in his studio, the artist is now concentrating on his own paintings, which he sells for up to $12,000 a piece. Paintings which have received a somewhat lukewarm response, to say the least. I was really disappointed by what I saw so far uh, because it even looks weak on a technical scale. He's not at all talented as far as I'm concerned. Nothing has changed. He remains mediocre in his own artistic output. Perhaps that's why Wolfgang Beltraki refused to let us show his paintings in our documentary. Today he's selective about the appearances he makes and is building his own legend. That of an aging hippie, a talented artist who was simply pleasing himself, never mind the millions of euros he stole along the way. <laughs>